Praise the Lord, everybody. In the book of Acts, chapter number 8, and verse number 31. And I'm only reading this because this is primarily where the, the subject is coming from. And, and then I will go, I'll branch off from there. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, and verse 31, it says... And he said, how can I, except some man guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Let me just stop right there. And I want to talk about this particular thing, <laughs> except some man guide me. And this goes directly against a lot of the things that are being taught today, especially on social media. God tells me, God speaks to me, God reveals to me. This is the trend that people are in today. And yet the Bible gives us demonstrations over and over and over that we cannot feed ourselves, and that we need someone to guide us through the word of God or we're not gonna get an understanding. I think I used this example before. Um, if, if I was to be given all of the ingredients, and I'm not talking about the kind that you buy in the box and all you do is put some milk in it and stir it up and then pour it in a pan. If someone gave me all the ingredients to make a cake, just because I have all the ingredients doesn't mean I know how to make a cake. Certain things have to be put in in a certain order, and you can't just dump it all into one bowl and put it in the oven. So someone has to show you or tell you how to do it the right way, or you have a mess on your hands. There are some things that seem to make sense, but it doesn't. Does anybody know what temperature you bake a cake at? For, at 350 degrees for how long? 35 minutes? 35 to 40 minutes. Let's just say 40 minutes. But I'm in a hurry. So I put it at 700 degrees for 20 minutes. I mixed all the ingredients properly. Exactly the way the instructions said. I just needed it done quicker. How about I need to make sure that I, I want it to be fresh and hot, so I put it at 150 degrees for 40, 80 minutes, for an hour and 20 minutes. What am I going to have? Some dried out mess. It won't be a cake, though. Some things have to be done in a specific order or you will have a mess on your hands. And what we see today is people that are trying to explain God's word without doing it in the proper order. Doesn't the Bible says the, use the phrase rightly dividing the word of truth? Amen. You know what scripture I'm talking about? Uh, what's the first part of it? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that, nope, that's not it. it a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, well, if there's a right way to divide it, there's a wrong way too. Isn't that what that implies? If it says to do it the right way, then that means there has to be a wrong way. And yet society today is Pushing the, I'm building my own personal relationship with God. I don't go to church. I don't go to organized religion. I just don't believe in that. I'm, I'm more spiritual, and I have a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with the Lord. No, you don't. Amen. You have a personal relationship with your flesh, right. and you read the Bible. Right. So we have to do it God's way. How can I understand what the Bible is about if someone doesn't guide me in it. So 
What is it about? Well, Jesus said this, St. John chapter 5. And starting at verse number 38. And we'll read through 40. 38 through 40. And ye have not this word, his word abiding in you, for whom he sent, ye believe not. So, who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to church people. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the lawyers, the scribes. He's talking to the priest. He's talking to those who are supposed to know God, but they're fighting against him every step of the way. And he says, you don't have the word abiding in you. You might can quote the scripture, but it's not living in you. If you had it living in you, then you would believe who God sent. And then he says, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Search the scriptures. But how can you search if someone doesn't guide you in your search? That's how people get things mixed up. That's how they get things jumbled up. Because they look through the Bible and because they see one word and then they see that same word over here, they're like, oh, these two scriptures must go together. And sometimes nothing could be further from the truth. Do you know why there are some people who believe that the rapture will take place at the end of the tribulation? Do you know why there are some people who believe that the rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation? Now, I, and I'm not making fun of anybody. There's a reason why. Because the word isn't being rightly divided. If you read Matthew chapter 24 and 25... It'll have you all mixed up if you don't know how to divide it right. And I heard a brother, I had a minister come to me one day and he was like, yeah, well, so-and-so hasn't happened yet because the moon hasn't turned to blood. I said, well, if you hear when that takes place, you've missed the rapture. Well, no, I haven't. No, because and if you look in Matthew and he's going back through and just quoting the scripture and it's like, brother, you're taking that all out of context. Now, here's the thing. I didn't know the proper context at the time. I knew, though, what he was saying was wrong. I got it now. Amen. Hallelujah. So you might think you know something, but Jesus says this. Search the scriptures. There was no New Testament when he said that, was there? There was no New Testament written. The apostles hadn't received the Holy Ghost yet. Jesus is still here. He's teaching them. He's training them. He's preparing them. Search what scriptures? The Old Testament. Search those. And what are you supposed to find? You're supposed to find Jesus in the Old Testament. It's all leading up to something. It's all bringing us to something. They were looking for a king. They were looking for someone to come in and deliver them. At this point in time in Israel's history, they were so lost and confused and demoralized. They, had, they, they were under the rule of other empires, other kings, other governments. All oh, they scattered all over. They're in Israel, but they don't have any control. They have to obey what the Romans tell them. It was a very sad thing. So they're looking for a Messiah. They're looking for a king to come and establish a kingdom so that they can be in charge. They were just tired of it. I don't, I don't, um, I don't fault them for that. I don't criticize them because they were tired of being under the rule of someone else. But if you're going to search the scriptures, 
it's important for you to know what it's saying. They were talking to the king. They were talking to the king of kings and didn't even know it. Do you know when it says that the word of the Lord came to Zacharias when he was in the temple and he was ministering and an angel of the Lord come to him and told him that he was going to have a son and he, Zachariah, doubted. And so the angel, he, 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 he needed some evidence. He said, okay, well, here's the proof. You won't speak until the child is born. And when he's born, you name him John. Now, why would the angel of the Lord come to Zechariah and not the high priest? I'll tell you why. Because the high priest wasn't right. So God went to somebody else and used somebody. It was, he should have been able. All right, let's look at John the Baptist. You got John the Baptist in the wilderness. He is baptizing people. Why is John baptizing people and not the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Why aren't they baptizing people? Because God couldn't use them. They were so in their own heads, their own mind. I know what I'm talking about. And when you get to that point, what can God tell you? I talk to people like that from time to time who will... Uh, let me know I'm wrong and this is what the Bible means. And, I, and I, by no means do I know everything, but when you're telling me that, oh, you, you, you know, the, the people, there are many ways for us to get to heaven and, and really all the Bible is looking for, the Bible is teaching us to all just love Jesus. I'm like, well, it's a little more than that. No. See, that's how people get on me. Oh, okay. I'm through. You're not interested in hearing anything anyway. You're interested in trying to persuade me that you're right. And if you have to persuade somebody that you're right, more than likely, you're wrong. Unfortunately, it's backwards today. It's the worldly church that's out trying to persuade everybody that they're right and we're wrong. And we're sitting back and we're not saying nothing. We're not trying to persuade anybody. All right, all right, all right. So Jesus tells them, search the scriptures. Go back and you look at the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it's all pointing to me coming and fulfilling what the scripture says. In the book of Matthew chapter 3, and we'll read two or three verses, two or three places real quick. Matthew chapter 3 and chapter 4, and then Mark. So Matthew 3. Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then go, jump over to chapter 4 and verse number 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in the book of Mark, chapter number 1, and verse number 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, there's these constant references to kingdom. How can you have a kingdom if you don't have a king. And this is what he keeps stressing. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Get yourself together. Why? Because search the scriptures. In them they testify of me. 
You think you got it right, but you don't. It's all pointing to a king coming and establishing his kingdom. So the entire Old Testament was in preparation for a coming king. That's what it's pointing to. Now, I don't want to make it look like um, there's no plan of salvation, because there certainly is. And you can see the plan of salvation throughout the Old Testament. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, you can preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You can preach baptism. You can preach receiving the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. The only thing you can't preach from the Old Testament is Jesus' name. That's it. Other than that, the entire plan of salvation is laid out in the Old Testament. So, if the Pharisees and the Sadducees got it wrong about the king, how about us today? Now, we've got double. We got an Old Testament and a New Testament that we can search. But the problem is when you sit and search it by yourself. If someone does not explain it, how can you understand it? What do you think when on the day of Pentecost, what do you think Peter preached? From the New Testament, he's just kind of winging it as he went. Where do you think he got all of that from? He was preaching Old Testament. So how did he come up with baptism? and receiving the Holy Ghost. Where he just made that up on the, on the fly. He's just like, you know what? I feel, I feel inspired by God. No. He's preaching what the Old Testament said. Now, in the New Testament, they took it and they explained that's what that meant. This is what that meant. When he said this, that's what that meant. These ceremonies that did this, that's what that was all about. Now we're doing it. Romans chapter 10, and this is a oftentimes confusing scripture, and I've, I've seen people argue over it, but just, just consider what I say here. Romans, I'm going way too far. It's at, it's at the end of Acts. Go ahead. Yes. Mark chapter 1, yes. Search the scriptures. <laughs> Say. I just did. Uh, where did I say Romans? Romans chapter 10. And we start at verse number two. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking about his people, the Jews, that they have uh, a zeal. If, matter of fact, if you look at verse 1, chapter 10 and verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He's writing to the brethren. Now, the, first of all, there are people who think that this book was written f for the Gentiles, how they were to be saved. And it's, they, they say it's the Paul's Roman road to salvation. No, it's not. He's writing to people that are already saved. That's why he calls them brethren. He said, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They want or they are kind of on fire. You know, they're, consider this. For hundreds of years, they have followed the customs and the laws, not to the letter. But what other people can you say for this many hundred years have still served one God, even though they messed it up? But they haven't jumped all off into serving Baal and other 
other false gods, the Roman gods, the Greek gods. They didn't get into that. They still stayed to themselves. They married like God told them to do, to only marry their own brethren. They, they stayed in the temple worship. They kept sacrificing animals. They were doing that. But their hearts weren't right. But let's be fair. They couldn't be right anyway. Let me give you two quick examples. In the tabernacle, they were to light the, the, the candle every day, right? They had to fill the lamp with oil. They had to trim the wicks, and they had to light it every single day. But how about the Sabbath? It says that thou shalt not kindle fire on the Sabbath. So how could they be right? All right, let me give you one more example. Every male child that's born on the eighth day, they were to be circumcised, right? Well, what happened if the eighth day was the Sabbath? Don't be circumcised on the eighth day, you're cut off, period. So are you saying that God had the system set up to where they couldn't, they had to be cut off if you was just happened if, your eighth day fell on the Sabbath, you just cut off from your people. No, it didn't. But how could they observe everything that God had, would he ask of them, and yet some of it made them contradict the law? So in all fairness, no matter how well they followed it, they still couldn't be obedient to it. And God did that on purpose. He wanted them to know that you think you're right, but you can't be right. You think you're holy, but you're not holy. And how do I know? Because the law says to do thus and so, and I can't be obedient to it. So there was a purpose behind what God did. They had a zeal of God, but it wasn't according to knowledge. You know why? because they wouldn't let anybody teach them. And we see the same thing today. There are people who have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. They, they do all kind of crazy things and think that that makes them right with God. I don't know if you've noticed these crosses that are on the trees around here. You're driving out of the village, you see these little yellow crosses that are somebody, they're reflective and somebody put them up on the tree. I know who did it, but. What does that got to do with being saved and winning people to Christ? I see signs that say, Jesus is coming soon. John 3.16. Who does that help? They have a zeal. They want to do something, but not according to knowledge. If you want to be right, then you got to be holy. Amen. If you want to help somebody else be right, help them be holy. Help them. Because nobody's getting to heaven that's not holy. Amen. Follow peace with all men and holy. holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Or how about this? Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. You're not getting to heaven unholy. Amen. I don't care how much somebody loves you. I don't care how many preachers get up and put you in heaven. You are not getting there unless you've been holy. So you can have a zeal. You can be on fire for God and be all wrong. There was a man, there was in one of our councils that we were having here, I think it was in Michigan, I'm not, I'm not completely sure on that. Came in and Bishop Paddock was teaching a Bible class and he said, he stood up while Bishop Paddock was teaching, he stood up and said, the Lord gave me a word. The time is coming when men are gonna be able to marry men and women are gonna be able to marry women. And Bishop Paddock said, brother, you are out of order. I've got the message for today. Now, was he wrong? 
But the way he went about it was, you don't come in and cause confusion and disruption. And God doesn't tell you to do that. So you might have an idea to do right, but just do it the wrong way. And God does not go along with man's philosophy of the ends justify the means. I lied so I could go to church. That doesn't, that doesn't work with God. I know what it's like to be beat for going to church, but I never lied. I just took my whipping. I got all kind of punishment for coming to church. I never lied, never said, oh, I didn't go. Do you go to church? And, he, and, and, my, and my dad knew that. He knew we wasn't going to lie. You go to church? Yeah, go get my belt. Now, you think the devil didn't put it in my mind? Just go on and lie. But the ends don't justify the means. Doing wrong so that you can be right doesn't work ever with God. And so we have to do it God's way. Now, I want to get to the part where it's confusing. Uh, Verse number three, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now, there are those who said, well, the law came to an end. But did it? Did did the Lord, it says Christ is the end of the law. All right, well, here's what the, I'll just give you a quick example. The word let, sometimes in the Bible, the word let means to allow. Sometimes the word let means to hinder. It's an archaic definition. But at one time, the word let in the English language meant to um, hinder something. So, We have another word that's similar to that. The word end has more than one definition. Let me give you the definition that goes with this passage. An outcome worked toward. Another one is the objective by virtue of or for the sake of which an event takes place. So here's what he's saying. Christ is the outcome of the law worked toward for man to live God's righteousness. He's the outcome. He is what it was all pointing to. He is the fulfillment of the law. And not that he came to fulfill it as in doing something. He is the fulfillment of it. It all pointed to him. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they that testify to the fact that I am the fulfillment of what this is all about. I'm the king that was to come. That's what all of the Old Testament is about. About a king that's coming that's going to deliver God's people. And take out for his name's sake, a people who were not a people. That's us. We were nobodies. We were filthy Gentiles. And I believe now, and and this is just speculation on my part. I don't have it anywhere in the Bible. I believe now that in the rapture, there will be more Gentiles than Jews than Israel because we have taken over this religion it is rare to hear that someone that's Jewish has converted to Christianity and don't be deceived by the um, Jews for Jesus don't don't be deceived with that they've just taken one bad thing and compounded it with another bad thing that's all oh yes now they believe in a trinity That's, that's paganism 
they, they're getting involved with all of this stuff, and they just, I've accepted Yeshua in my heart. You don't find that nowhere in the Bible. So they call themselves Jews for Jesus. They got a zeal, but without knowledge. Yep. There's a remnant. Isn't that what the Bible says? A remnant would be saved. Very small portion. And how much of a remnant? Well, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added. And another place, 2,000 souls. Let's just say during the, during the first century, 10,000 people received the Holy Ghost. Out of 144 million, that'll be saved. That'll be in the rapture. That's, that's not a lot. What did I say? 144? What in the world? <laughs> that's, that's not right. It's 10,000 times 10,000. 100 million. I don't know where I got 144 million from. 100 million. It'll be 100 million. 10,000 times 10,000. That's who was around the throne. It's in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. The thousands of thousands is the angels. And how much is a thousand thousands? Well, that's the reason why the Bible says an innumerable company of angels. Because that's not, you can't, you can't calculate thousands of thousands. But you can calculate 10,000 times 10,000. So the world has it backwards. They think there's 100 million angels and there's going to be an innumerable company of saints in heaven. No. No, 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 no. He's specific about it. But if you wrongly divide it, and some folks get an attitude about it. They don't like the idea that you can number that because they want everybody to be right with God. I get challenged every now and then over this. I don't think that that's what the scripture means. Okay. I don't even argue with folks no more. Mm. Speaking of which, my wife said I said something and I need to correct it. I don't remember saying it, but she said, last week you said in Bible class, you don't care about the saints. I said, no, I didn't. She said, yes, yes, you did. Well, I'm like, well, all right. I, I, if I said that, it was like the 144 million. I misspoke. I didn't mean that. I do care about the saints. I, I said, what I think I said was, I'm not chasing behind nobody. I'm not trying to spy on folks and see it, make sure that they're living right. That's up to them. I'm trying to make sure I'm living right. But I worry about the saints. I do. I, I, I want everybody to be right. So Jesus is the end of the law. Not that the law came to a stop. He simply is the fulfillment of it. Now, we have that in us. Don't we have the Holy Ghost in us? Unless there's, there's, unless there's a God and a Son and a Holy Ghost, we have Jesus in us. So we have the fulfillment of the law inside of us. We don't have to go back now and start reading through the Old Testament, try and figure out what it was that God wanted. We've got it in us now. And there's some things, I'll, I'll say it this way, there are some things that come instinctively to us. Even though we haven't been taught it. Now, not that you're never going to do something wrong, but because we do have to be taught. There are sins that we commit ignorantly. But there are some things Having the Holy Ghost in us, it's like, uh, that, that don't feel right. I don't, uh, I'm not going along with that. I've done it. I've done it many times. And just like, you know, that, that just didn't feel right. And I'm telling another pastor about it. And it's like, so-and-so said this. And it was like, man, that just didn't feel right. And it's like, no, it's not right. Because the Bible says, and take me right to a scripture. I didn't know. 
but it just didn't feel right in my spirit. It's like something about that doesn't feel like that's the way God would do something. And so I just kind of, I'll leave it alone until I'm sure. That's the beauty of having the Holy, the Holy Ghost down inside of us. Galatians chapter 3. Paul kind of deals with this a little bit further from a different perspective in verse number 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. So there's this comparison that he's drawing between faith and the law. The law had me bound, but faith has set me free. And I'm not quoting scripture with that. Faith, I'm saved by faith. Saved by grace through faith. Without faith, I can't be saved. Amen. But with the law, I'm kept under bondage. Amen. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. So faith, the law was only an instructor. Have you ever seen professionals, college students? I, I, I have. I, I know one who has three PhDs, and it's not from uh, Southwestern Michigan College. <laughs> he has three PhDs from Oxford University in England. He graduated with my brother. He's a professional college student. He's, he, I ask him, why, why, why three PhDs? I mean, I love college. I just love it. I go, okay. So he's constantly under a schoolmaster. When does he ever receive? When does he ever get to go out and use? He doesn't because he's always under a school teacher. That's what the law was to Israel. It was a teacher for them, teaching them that the king is coming. But they refuse to leave the schoolmaster. They become professional students. And what has it gotten them? Nothing. It got them left behind. If you can't take what the school teacher, what the schoolmaster was doing, what it was bringing you to, and you get the finished product, there's no point. I wanted to get out of school as quick as I could. Nothing more boring to me than just sitting in class. Very boring. Some people enjoy it, and I'm not criticizing them. It just ain't my thing. And I was in a profession where I had to do a whole bunch of sitting and reading, and I hated it. And I would, most of the time I messed up because I would read a little bit, tinker a little bit, read a little bit, tinker a little bit. <laughs> I eventually I'd get there, but if I would have just taken the time to read it all and then tinker, I would have saved myself a lot of steps. The law was their schoolmaster. Now, when you have a schoolmaster, when you graduate, don't you do higher than what your teacher taught you? If you're in school and your teacher is teaching you a, the principles of accounting, you go out and you become an accountant. Now you're above your teacher. If you are being taught mechanics in a school and you, your professor is only a teacher, I'm not talking about a working instructor. I, I, I have to say that because I know somebody's going to grab me after class. Well, you know, there are some, 
I know this is an example. Let me, let, let me use uh, Minister Wicker. I gotta beef, I'm gonna beat up on some. No. It's just been a while and I hadn't heard his name so I thought I'd throw it out there. A teacher can tell you how to do something but there's a difference between teaching it and doing it. So the law could only take us just so far and then we had to leave that and actually do what was being taught by the schoolmaster. But how could we do that without the teacher in us? So we get the Holy Ghost. Now we've got the author and the finisher of our faith inside of us. We have the school master fully formed now in us. Now we start a whole new lesson. You have heard it said of them of old. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say, now the author says, what I meant by what that was, don't even look at another woman. You know why? Because do you remember when they brought the woman that was caught in adultery to Jesus? Did he rebuke them for looking? They caught her, didn't they? Did he rebuke them for looking? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, it don't say not to look at it. So Jesus now... He didn't say it because of that. I don't want you to think that. He said it because that's what God meant. That's what the law was bringing them to. Don't commit adultery. Don't even think about it. Leave it alone. If it ain't your wife, leave it alone. Ain't your husband, leave him alone. Praise the Lord with him. Hug him. Go on about your business. Well... Not even the apostles understood fully what the kingdom of God was. The kingdom of God is in two parts. Oh, come on, saints. <laughs> St. John chapter 3, I'll show you. Only Minister Wicker was shaking his head yes. I got, I got no back. See, you see how they forsook me that quick? St. <laughs> John 3, 3, except, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And be born, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, is that what we've done? Thank you. Got one amen, a couple of nods and a yes. Were we not born of the water and the spirit? Yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just, I'm just checking. <laughs> it's not a trap. Jesus said it. <laughs> Except a man is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot see nor enter. Right? All right. Yes, ma'am. Oh, amen. I had to slow it down a little. We have to be born of the water and the spirit. Are we there right now? Are we in the kingdom of God right now? Because the kingdom of God is what? It's not meat and drink. What is it? It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, right? That's where we are. That's spiritual. 
We're in the kingdom of God, spiritual. Uh, Romans 14. I'll just make sure that we know where it is. And verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is a spiritual thing. Righteousness, peace, joy. You can't touch any of that. It's all in us. Luke 14. Sorry, I'm using a lot of scriptures. I, I know people don't like to have a lot. Okay, thank you. Luke 14 and verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That's what we are doing right now. We are eating bread in the kingdom of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. But don't you know that some saints get the Holy Ghost and have the same attitude about the bread that we have now that the children of Israel had about manna? What is this manna? What is this? This white bread that he has given us. What? I'm tired of it. My soul is dried up. I'm tired of eating. I want what the world has. If you don't believe it, just listen to the music that's coming into the church. They're bringing the world into the church. The world dances at parties. Now we're dancing in the church. The world, they bring pom-poms to their games, to their sporting events. Now we're bringing pom-poms in the church. We're chasing behind what the world is doing. We're getting our haircuts like the world. We're getting our clothes like the world. We're using lingo like the world. We're bringing it all in the church. And now we don't even want to talk about Jesus no more. We want to talk about blessings. Oh, there's a real problem in the church. I can understand now why in the book of Revelation he says, and even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. One of the saints sent me a, a link today where, uh, who was it? Uh, some of these, is it Harvard? What? Anna, I'm telling on you. That link you sent to me, where were they from? Harvard? Harvard Medical are saying that a child can decide whether they're LGBTQIA plus as a baby. And the lady said, they can't walk, they can't talk, can't crawl. Can't, they, can't, they can't, I'm adding now, they can't feed themselves. They, they can't communicate any kind of way other than crying. How are you going to figure out the LGB from a baby's cry? And these are intelligent people. Harvard Medical? We've lost our minds. It's like, Lord, you've got to come quick because the world is getting crazy. And, and I'm going to be honest about it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of seeing all the foolishness going on. And you know where it's ending up? In the church. I was in Indianapolis driving down Allisonville Road. One of the churches got a rainbow on their sign. Oh, yeah. It's coming. It's coming, y'all. Persecution is coming. Ridicule is coming. Some of us is going to lose our jobs over this foolishness. Oh, yeah. Some of us are going to be estranged from our families because of this foolishness. But we still have to hold on to what is right. Some of us are going to have jobs and they're going to make you try and teach people that being a part of the LGBTQIA plus, 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 plus community 
is right. And we're going to have to stand. No, I won't teach this. Oh, yeah. Some of us are going to have fights with our children because they're teaching it in the schools. And we're the ones. You know, don't, don't have the school teach your children. That's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say let the school train up a child in the way they should go. You train them up. I'll take it a step further. I'm glad they don't have prayer in school. I don't want my children praying to Muhammad. I don't want my children praying to Buddha. And if, they gotta, if they're going to teach them Christian prayer, they're gonna have to, it won't take long before somebody's fighting and they're going to have them. Now you need to teach from the Quran. That ain't the place for it. You want your children to know about God? You teach them at home about God. You teach your children to pray for their food. You teach your children to pray at night before they go to bed. You teach your children the Bible. Teach them to memorize Bible verses. Teach them what's right and wrong. Don't wait for the school to do it. I don't want the school teaching my children about God because they got it all wrong anyway. Come home and talk about there's a trinity. I don't want them teaching my children that kind of stuff. So... I know we get all up in arms that they've taken prayer out of school. Well, now the Supreme Court's getting ready to put it back. I hope they don't. I don't want you bothering with my children when it comes to God. Already got a big enough mess on their hands. And it's not the teacher's fault. Oh, no, 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 no. It's not the teacher's fault. They're following the instructions that's handed down from the, from the uppers. The ones that ain't in the classroom dealing with these bad kids. Hey Amen. Y'all got me all fired up. Now I'm mad. <laughs> we are eating bread in the kingdom right now. But there's another part. St. John chapter 18. I'm about to work my way out of this, uh, Minister Wicker. Thank you for my supporting me in the time of my need. Amen. Amen. St. John 18 and verse number 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should be or that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is. Now is my kingdom not from hence. If it's not here, where is it? Well, it's somewhere else then, isn't it? My kingdom is not of this world. I got a different kingdom. He's got a physical kingdom. And we get to go to it. Matthew 20 and 20 through 23. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit the one on the right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said unto him, We are able. Ooh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this. When God asks a question, you got to be real careful. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to be silent and pretend like you didn't hear nothing. Then he said unto them, ye shall drink indeed of my cup. Right. What cup is he talking about? So, the cup of suffering. Amen. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. What baptism is he talking about? Talking about water? No, fire. Right. <laughs> uh, but to sit 
on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Where is Jesus right now? Back in heaven. So if we're going to sit on his right hand and his left, that means that there's got to be an there's got to be a physical kingdom that he's going to set up to. Please don't come back and say, well, you know, God is everywhere. He doesn't have a right hand or a left hand. Don't. I know that, saints. You see, I get beat up after church. <laughs> Pastor, I know you see it. <laughs> I get beat up all the time. Amen. I'm not complaining about it. I, I, I pretty, if I'm teaching it, then I'm pretty sure of it. Amen. Amen. So he's not talking about the kingdom of God here where it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We're not going to be on the right and left of God right now. Right now, we're trying to be holy. We're living as holy as we know how to be. Then in Luke chapter 13 and verse 28 through, let's see, 13, 28 and 29. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and ye yourselves thrust out. That's not right now. We're not seeing Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, maybe. Uh, we do see prophets. False prophets, yeah. False, that you're right. False prophets. Uh, and behold, or they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. That's a place. This is not talking about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is talking about some place. And in, if you just jump to chapter 21 here in Luke. And verse 29. 21, 29 through 31. 21, verse 29. And he spake. To them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. We seeing it. We are, we are seeing it right now. All of the things that he said would take place is coming to pass. The prophecies about the way the world would be in the last days, all of that is coming to pass. But how can you know these things unless someone guides you? You can't. Amen. Amen. Don't fall into the trap that the world is falling into. They've got YouTube for their pastor. Right, that's right. Now, here's the beauty of YouTube. You can be on there and be preaching the truth. Do you know how hard it is to find truth? Right. Just look up apostolic right. and listen to the foolishness that's going on. They're all trying to get as many people to follow them as possible. So some of them are saying some crazy stuff, just trying to get likes, just trying to get followers and subscri uh, uh, subscriptions or subscribers, just trying to do that. Craziness. We have been given by God what we need. We have. And I'm not against uh, preachers on YouTube. I listen to some. But I listen to ones I know are preaching the truth. Amen. Now, are teaching the truth. Amen. Amen. I, sometimes I throw uh, 
Faith of the Apostles on over in Papa, and I listen to them. Sometimes I throw Bishop Raider Johnson on. Sometimes District Elder Richardson, I throw him on. Sometimes Timothy Johnson, Bishop Timothy Johnson from, I don't even know where he's from, somewhere down, Alabama, yeah, somewhere in Alabama, but I don't, Montgomery, Alabama. I'm selective. But so many people are preaching on Instagram where they get 30 seconds or 60 seconds or two minutes. You can't, you can't feed somebody in two minutes. They're doing the, the shorts, the video shorts. Uh, I know there's more than Instagram that has the shorts. TikTok, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, they have shorts, YouTube has shorts, and they're trying to feed people and teach them the word of God in two or three minutes or less. You can't get to praise God good enough in two or three minutes. And you're trying to tell somebody how to be saved in that length of time, and they will tell, they're strong too, talking real strong. Somebody sent me a Actually, my wife sent me a video clip of somebody talking. Girl looked like she was crazy, like she had lost her mind. Yeah. I'll be honest, she looked like she was filled with the devil yeah. talking about God. But she wasn't talking about my God. Right. She's talking about a different God altogether. I don't know what, what, who, who her God is, but you know, just because they say Jesus, right. the Apostle Paul said, if any man preach another Jesus... Right. Some people talking about Jesus, but not the kind of Jesus I'm serving. They're not talking about the Jesus that's in me. Amen. I can just listen to some of that and hear the foolishness like, oh, Lord, this is, this is bad. And, you know, sometimes the saints fall for it because it sounds good. Amen. Amen. Don't let them kind of people guide you. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Revelation 21 or 22. Yep, she said the last chapter, last verse. Doesn't that kind of warn against that? Um, oh, 22, 19. I went to 19. And, like, what? 22, 19. Her question is um, where it says, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Well, that is quite literally talking about the book of Revelation. But there are warnings throughout the entire Bible about false prophets. In the book of Jeremiah, he is hard on false pastors, false prophets, priests that are not doing right. So throughout the Bible, there are all kinds of things. But to be clear, it's evident enough that he's talking about the book of Revelation, but certainly change any part of God's word and he's going to get you. Amen. Oh, yeah. He'll take your name out the book of life. Actually, uh, your name wasn't in there. Amen. He already knew. Every name that's going to be, I know we think that he's sitting in heaven with a pencil. <laughs> writing names down every time somebody gets the Holy Ghost, he's at, there's a new name written down in glory. No, he already saw before he said, let there be, he already saw every single name that's written in the Lamb's book of life. He already knew them all. Now, the question is, and the question we should be asking is, Lord, is my name written in there? You might get the Holy Ghost, but that don't mean your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because there's going to be some folks with the Holy Ghost going to miss the rapture. Some folks baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, speak in tongues every service, sometime every day, just dancing all up and down the aisles, running all over for Jesus, and going to go to the lake of fire. Because that's not what he asked for. He said, be ye holy. 
even as your Father which is in heaven is holy. Be holy. And then he came and lived the perfect example of what holy was like. Just in case you didn't think you could do it, I'll do it first, then require it from you. Anything else? Stand on your feet.